Welcome to presentation number 24 in our series, Rereading Revelation. We are rereading this book in pursuit of its vision of healing, and we think that we have to reread it because uh, we have serious misreadings in <coughs> this book in the reading tradition. So, the topic today is the earth. We are in the home stretch. And uh, for the last uh, parts of this series, I wish to focus on images of healing in the ending of the book of Revelation, and now the healing of the earth. <coughs> so these are the six topics that will uh, conclude the main body of the series. We have done the name, we have done the tears, we're doing the earth uh, now, and yet to come is the city, the nations, and a reflection on Revelation's view of time. And to <coughs> put this in, a, sort of organize it in a different way, we are putting the name at the center. And around the name is time, tears, earth, city, and nations. Uh, some of these other terms could be candidates for the center, but they all came up short, including time. So the name will be at the center, and the topic now is here, uh, it's uh, the earth. So, <coughs> we are immediately uh, facing uh, some surprises here, uh, at least three surprises. Surprise number one, it should end in heaven, but it ends on earth. Surprise number two, it should end in a garden, but it ends in a city. And surprise number three, <coughs> it ends on earth because God wants to be here rather than there. So those are big surprises because in the usual Christian narrative, indeed in many narratives of an afterlife, the earth is a dispensable item. You leave the earth and you never see it again. You go to heaven and you say goodbye to earth and you won't be there. Uh, it won't have a role anymore. That is not how Revelation puts it. For in Revelation, the journey ends on the earth. And we read, <coughs> uh, and I now put into my translation what uh, can easily be defended and what I have uh, explained in more detail in my commentary. And I saw a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the renewed Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, made ready as a bride beautified for her husband. So there would not be much point in calling the city Jerusalem if it had no connection to earthly reality. So that's why we put renewed in all of these things. New heaven, that is, heaven renewed. And new earth, that is, earth renewed. And new city, that is, the city renewed. So all of these are actions of renewal. And just to put it into a wider sort of cosmic frame of reference, and yes, we know a lot more about the cosmos now than we did before, thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope that was deployed 30 years ago. And I have, maybe more than 30 years ago, I have just heard in the news that it is going to be replaced by a much bigger and much better telescope than, than what Hubble has done for us. But here we see all these amazing galaxies and all these other places that you might want to think that would be a reasonably good place to be. <coughs> but in Revelation, it is the Earth, this Earth, that we are familiar with where we were born, where some of us will die, and if there is a life to come, it will be ultimately life on that earth. That is what we're talking about here. 
So <coughs> Revelation's vision is indeed of an earth that is broken and an earth that will be healed and renewed and there will be more than band-aid to fix it but that's you get the idea. This earth is going to be healed and Revelation is on this point a huge corrective to <coughs> narratives or storylines about <coughs> the journey of faith that's supposed to end ultimately in heaven. I have not and I have actually said that there seems to be an interim sojourn in heaven, a sort of evacuation from earth to heaven that is temporary and then going back to earth. <coughs> so this will still register it as a surprise. <coughs> and we read now on in Revelation 21 verses 3 and 4, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! The dwelling place of God is among human beings. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes and death will be no more, nor grief, nor wailing, nor pain will be any more for the former state of things has passed away. So here we have an emphasis on God being with human beings, God being among human beings on earth. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven to earth and God comes also down as it were in a kind of relocation move. And we can picture it like this. Here is <coughs> the earth and, and I'm not sure how much luggage that needs to be included, but this is a moving enterprise, uh, a cosmic mo re relocation as it were, and <coughs> you can think of it this way. This is <coughs> God's suitcase and the address is Earth. So when we put the name at the center, I asked, I said that the name is at the center and the re thinking the name will influence many things but when we look at the name and the earth maybe the thought that God relocates to earth also changes our perception of the name which impresses you the most the redeemed going to heaven to spend eternity with God in heaven or God coming to earth to spend eternity with human beings in an earthly context. This is, of course, talking theologically. And I have shown this <coughs> picture before. This is about the story as it relates to, to Jesus, as it relates to the incarnation from heaven, incarnation to earth, to heaven, back to earth, the second coming, then this interim relocation, <coughs> evacuation, uh, to heaven and then finally it's all earth. We are going to be in an earthly setting. And then the con there is a, just like in Revelation, uh, the Old Testament connects the renewal of earth and the renewal of city. And both are in Isaiah chapter 65 and chapter 65 and 66 in Isaiah are a very big contributors to Revelation's vision. Uh, of the ending the, to the uh, <coughs> Revelation's images of healing. For behold, I create new heavens, renewed heavens, and a new earth, renewed earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Very similar to Revelation. And here about the city, <coughs> be glad and rejoice forever uh, in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and, and here you get Revelation 21, 3 and 4. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, or the cry of distress. So these Revelations, images of healing, draw on Old Testament antecedents, but it magnifies them and takes them to completion. That's what we are seeing. <clears throat> so 
by another line of thinking, the relocation of God from heaven to earth is not a surprise. That, that is uh, <coughs> rather something that is uh, intrinsic to the kind of person God is. Remember when we uh, started in Revelation in chapter 1, <coughs> we read this in introduction, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from the one who is and the one who was and the one who is to come. That's an odd statement, but it is a statement similar to God, the way God talked to Moses in the burning bush uh, back in the Old Testament. And then from Jesus Christ, the witness, the trustworthy one, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So how did we, uh, what we, did we say about this text when we discussed it earlier? We said that this is not a statement that tells us that God exists. It is rather a statement that tells us what kind of person God is. is. It is not the idea of eternity, which is primary when the Israelites pronounce the name Yahweh, but that of presence. God is he who is with someone. And here, it's all that way here uh, in the dwelling place of God is among human beings, dwell with them. God himself will be with them. See, it's all there and it's amazing. <coughs> so, uh, relocation is then not a surprise if that is the disposition of God to be with someone. That's why it is not a surprise. And here is another reason why it isn't so surprising, the Sabbath. So the relocation is not a surprise if we get under the skin of Sabbath theology in the Old Testament and in the New, where God is present, God finishes the work, and then he enters human reality as a participant. And we see that also in the Gospel of John in the Sabbath healings of Jesus. I will read a couple of statements from Jürgen Moltmann, one of the uh, greatest theologians of the 20th century, <coughs> in, from a book called The Coming of God. The Sabbath in the time of the first creation links this world and the world to come, the beginning and the end. It is the presence of God in the time of those he has created, or to put it more precisely, the dynamic presence of eternity and time which links the beginning and the end, thus awakening remembrance and hope. At the end, God is with people. At the beginning, God was with what he had created. And God being with someone is the essence of Sabbath theology. Sabbath as divine commitment, and not simply Sabbath as divine commandment. So something God obligates himself to do and promises to do. And here is one more, Sabbath and Shekinah, because Revelation uses the word tabernacle. The tabernacle of God is with human beings. And here there is then a link of Sabbath as a time element and Shekinah as a space element. <coughs> and here is what Moltmann says, Sabbath and Shekinah are related to each other as promise of fulfillment beginning and completion. In the Sabbath, creation holds within itself from the beginning the true promise of its consummation. God is with humans on earth. Big surprise. Yes, big surprise, because the story has been distorted, has in some ways lost its way. But not such a big surprise when you think about God's disposition to be someone, be with someone, and the Sabbath, God's investment in Sabbath as presence with human beings. And there is another statement here to bring, take this uh, home. Again, we are in Isaiah 65, the great contributor to Revelation's ending, and, and Isaiah 66. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered nor come to, or come to mind. That obviously echoes in Revelation 21. And then in uh, Isaiah 66, 
uh, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. Name, name, see? <coughs> from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So there in the Isaiah's vision of renewal, there is Sabbath, but that is really not surprising either because Sabbath was configured to convey to uh, convey to uh, this message to us the divine commitment. <coughs> so it will be like before, it will be restored, but it will also be better than before. That is the strange thing here. And there are so such uh, <coughs> amazing elements of even better. And the one who was seated on the throne <coughs> said, look, I am making all things renewed. All things renewed now. And he's also said, right, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Omega, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who win the war will inherit these things and I will be their God and they will be my children. So there is an element of intimacy in the vision of the ending that is even greater than any notion of intimacy we could infer when we look at the story of creation in Genesis. So, so <clears throat> back to this slide and now to recalibrate the surprise because we have de dealt with one side of it and the f f side f earlier is really mostly about the name. God wishing to be an, on earth, God wishing to be among us. <clears throat> But we need to look a little more at the meaning of earth itself. And another corrective <coughs> to the Christian tradition. So <coughs> the surprise of earth now, earth thinking in, in very basic, about its basic constituents, earth as soil, earth as materiality. And here I will <coughs> take a step back into the history of Christianity. This person who I think highly of, he is the most influential thinker still today in Eastern Christianity and the Orthodox community, like in Greek Orthodoxy, Russian Orthodox Church. Origen is the main theologian there. His dates is long ago, 185 to 254. He lived in the city of Alexandria which is in Egypt and is still there. And he was a very learned man and he was a prolific writer. And he was, unfortunately, we will have to say, very influenced by the thought of Plato, who did not think that matter and the earth was all that good. So let's read what Origen says. If therefore these conclusions appear logical, it follows that we must believe that our condition will be at some future time incorporeal. And this incorporeal condition shall be the privilege of all who come within the scope of this subjection to Christ. This, by this statement, origin, origin's hor horizon for the world to come is a, is a world to come without bodies. And without earth, there is no need for it. That you, that being a material being, having a physical earth is a burden. It is sort of beneath, beneath the dignity of God's original plan. And he takes it home here in this other statement. It appears that even the use of bodies will cease. And if this happens, bodily nature returns to non-existence just as formerly it did not exist. So here, early on in the history of Christian thought, the belief in materiality 
a vision for, of a material world is really sort of dissipating. It's going up in, in vapor or in smoke, as it were. <coughs> and here, uh, just to give two examples, one from Egypt and one from Syria, and this is from places where I have had the privilege to visit. Um, this is Saint Anthony, who was an Egyptian uh, born of a high, in high family, who became a, a believer in Christ, and who also was one of the founders. He's considered the father of the monastic movement, but there was monasticism prior to him. See, his dates are quite early, 251 to 356. Uh, <coughs> Anthony withdraws to the desert near the Red Sea, somewhere here, and he lives in a cave uh, that you can vaguely spot here. And I am here in, in this place with my daughter, youngest daughter, who, who was uh, working in the embassy in Cairo. Uh, and uh, and uh, we wanted to see this hugely influential for the way one thinks about the world and the earth, the body. We need to put distance between ourselves and the body. The earth, we need to withdraw from the earth, from the world, from the city, from life. That a saintly life is a life of withdrawal, a life of renunciation of the material world. And it was hugely influential. And Augustine, back in Milano, uh, uh, let's see, about, uh, about the time when Anthony died, actually, because Augustine, uh, it was later, Augustine was born in 354. So some 20 30, 20, 30 years after the death of Anthony, Augustine reads the story of Anthony and is very moved and will eventually himself embrace monasticism. Well, we are <coughs> moving here to Syria, and we are here. Here is the city of Aleppo, and a little north outside, about 40, 50 kilometers from Aleppo. Uh, <coughs> and Syria today is a, is a great, mostly a Muslim country, but it wasn't that way <coughs> before the rise of Islam. It was a Christian country, thoroughly Christianized. And outside Aleppo here, there was a <coughs> figure, Simon, who is known as Simon on the Pillar, Simon Stylitis. And <coughs> uh, this is a source of pride for me, that I learned about Simon when I was in fourth grade. I was 10 years old. I was in school in a Norwegian public school and reading church history. And I heard about Simon on the Pillar <coughs> because <coughs> uh, and this is the site, and this is the remains of the pillar that was about, uh, let's see, 10 meters, about 40 feet high. And Simon spent all his life on that pillar for about 40 years, sitting on that pillar out there in the desert. And you can imagine me in Norway, in cold, wintry Norway, thinking about poor Simon sitting there in the winter and snow and winds <coughs> on that pillar. There, it's quite cold there, even in Syria it's quite cold, but not no, Norway cold, that is true. So with my daughters we went there. We have seen it, I wanted to see it very badly. The pilgrim church that was built around Simon's pillar is the second largest church in Eastern Christianity only surpassed by the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. So this was big, and it shaped Christian thought as a thought of withdrawal from the world, withdrawing into sort of ennobling the soul. Uh, what should I say? Silencing the body and, and disparaging the body, actually actually sort of disciplining and, and, and curbing the body, as it were. And <coughs> here I am, <coughs> next to Simon. It's real. I'm not inventing this. This is real history. It really happened. And the dates for Simon's stylitis are known, 390 to 459. And then this person, not seen as a joke, not seen as a caricature, 
He is the holy man. He lives out the Christian ideal of renunciation. And I have written a chapter somewhere saying that, that perhaps the rise of Islam can be explained by the contrast where the is, where Islam, <coughs> where the, in Islamic theology withdrawal from the world is not the ideal and that Islam in that respect represents a corrective to Christian thought. So <coughs> one of the experts on this time is Peter Brown, now an old man and in retirement, but he has been a prolific author and all his books are worth reading, wonderful books. Uh, the one I draw on here the most is probably The Body and Society, where <coughs> he talks about how Christian thought came to see the earth and the body. And I will uh, read a quote from that, and then we are almost <coughs> at our conclusion. When in the course of the late 5th and 6th centuries, profound changes sapped, sapped the political and economic structure of the cities of the Mediterranean, the Christian notions we have just described came to the fore. Now we get to see what is the DNA, the theological DNA of Christianity in relation to the body and the earth. They ratified a very different sense of community and the human person and of the human person within it from that current in the age of Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor in the second century. They made plain what Jacques Le Goff has described in a mem memorable phrase as la de route du corporel, the definitive route of the body, wasting the body, throwing it out, the body and the earth, that marked the end of the ancient world and the beginning of the Middle Ages. These are serious matters and revelations corrective, putting an earth before us it, at the end of the journey is by in this light much bigger than we might have thought. I call this the San Andreas fault of thought. The San Andreas fault is an earthquake prone zone in California where the we people who live in California think that's where the next big one, the next big earthquake will be. But the San Andreas fault in human thought is well expressed here by Wendell Berry who is one of my favorite American thinkers. And he says that the separation of the soul from the body and from the world is not a disease of the fringe or no aberration, but a fracture that runs through the mentality of institutional religion like a geologic fault. And this rift in the, in the mentality of religion continues to characterize the modern mind no matter how secular or worldly it becomes. We have big ticket items we need to think about in relation to the name in <coughs> Revelation, but we also have a big ticket item in relation to the earth and the material world as we can see here. <coughs> so. <coughs> We now, of course, have a, many places we have a scorched earth with the fires in California because we still don't know how to take care of this planet. We're still at a loss, as it were, uh, along the line of, <coughs> of uh, Wendell Berry's uh, concern that the mentality of disparaging the earth is continuing. And here, I think this is the tar, tar sands in Canada where there is, you know, no tomorrow, as it were. <coughs> so, so <coughs> this, these, are, these are images <coughs> that also are relevant to the need for renewal of the earth, as we see in Revelation, and also to our attitude to the earth on which we live. <coughs> so, so here we are going to read a couple more verses uh, and then conclude. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and the river, that is in the middle, 
<coughs> that is in the middle. On either side is in the middle of the street and the river that is in the middle. On either side is the tree of life, making 12 kinds of fruits, producing the fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. We're going to discuss this text in greater detail in uh, one of my uh, l later talks. Here is just to say that there is new. It's new, but it is also familiar <coughs> because the river of life, the tree of life are images from the original world in the book of Genesis. <coughs> so in the end of the story, we have the earth. We have affirmation of materiality, we have affirmation of earth, and we have a big theological element here in the relocation that God's dwelling is with humans on earth. <coughs> and then one big thought here, because how does this happen? What is this, what's the sort of venue, what's the pathway to renewal as uh, Revelation <coughs> sees it. And now we need to revisit the scene in Revelation chapter 5, the sealed scroll, something, some, a, an impasse, a road that is blocked, and how will it be opened? And then <coughs> the, we hear uh, the, uh, a voice saying, and one of the elders said to me, do not weep, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has won the war so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And my headline here is that the path to revelation, the path to restoration is through revelation. Someone comes into the world and reveals something. And that is what unlocks the promise of, re of restoration. It isn't just power. It isn't just turning a switch or something like that. And this passage in Isaiah chapter 11 cannot be read too well or too often uh, if we want to see the full range of this. A shoot will come forth from the stump of Jesse. That's the text that echoes in Revelation, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And a sprig will sprout forth from his roots and the spirit of Yahweh will rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and insight, spirit of sense and valor, spirit of knowledge and awe of Yahweh. And he will have as his pleasure the awe of Yahweh. This person com into, comes into the world as a revealer. And then we hear what he is doing. He does not judge according to appearances. He does not de decide simply based on mere rumor. And here in this circle you see a group of, of figures whispering to each other <coughs> something that gets, gets amplified in, this, in our time, a day and time in cyberspace. But with right judgment he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, revelation, the revealed word. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. And righteousness is the girdle of his hips. And faithfulness is the lo loincloth of his loins. <coughs> and then, and I don't mean this to be kitsch, but it's very hard to find in in the world of art, a scene that does justice to what happens in the wake of Revelation, according to Isaiah. Then the wolf will be a visitor with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the kid. Then the calf and the young lion will get fattened together, and a little lad will tend them. Then the cow and the bear will be friends with one another, and their young will lie down with one another. Then the lion will eat chopped straw like the cow, and the suckling will play near the hole of a viper. And toward a young viper, a child will stretch out his hand. No adversarial relations anymore. The predatory animal has been domesticated. They are all at peace. There is nothing wrong anymore. And then the clincher here. No one shall do anything evil or anything destructive upon my holy mountain.
for the land will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as waters covers the sea. What is it that accomplishes restoration? It is revelation. It's not just sort of mechanics. In the wake of revelation, there is restoration. So this is not an illustration of what happens. It is an illustration of what doesn't happen. It is not as just though God pushes a new creation button and voila, everything is, figure, is fine. It is the path of revelation that leads to restoration. And you see this in several Old Testament texts and in this illustration of the river of life by William Blake. I hope you can see it. But here, in closing, reading these texts uh, then uh, in, uh, in the Bible. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And then from Habakkuk, but the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And there goes the path of renewal.